What if I told you that a simple land restoration technique is bringing peace to one of the world's most ancient conflicts? Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Here on the edge of the Sahara Desert, farmers and herders have shared the same lands for centuries, coexisting and even working together. But just like anywhere in the world, when food is scarce and water runs dry, people become desperate and things can fall apart, even leading to violence. The situation is really complicated, and there are many root causes, politics, culture, history. But one thing stands out to me, competition over resources like water and land. And as landscapes are desertifying, the stakes are getting higher. But I'm here to see how creating abundant resources is a solution. I'm traveling in the Sahel of Africa with the largest humanitarian agency on Earth, the United Nations World Food Program, the first responders to hunger in war zones and disasters. And in this four-part series, I'm explaining the details of the mind-blowing work they're doing to actually solve hunger at its root cause. Like here in Chad, where the WFP, the government of Chad, and the farmers and herders of the Sahel region have banded together to try to resolve one of the world's most ancient sources of conflict. And the story begins at the Great Green Wall, where a massive strip of trees is being planted across the continent to hold back the Sahara Desert and feed the people. In the first two videos in this series, we took a deep dive into exactly how they're greening the desert by digging simple water harvesting structures called half moons. They've covered hundreds of thousands of hectares with these traditional structures. And after years of growth, we're seeing incredible food forests spreading across the region. This is actually working, except where it's not. So why is it that at some sites like this one here in Chad, the half moons are falling apart? The grasses are disappearing and the land is returning back to desert. After all this work they did, this seems like such a tragedy. What caused this to happen? Well, it turns out this damage is caused by herds of animals. You see, uncontrolled grazing can be harmful to the land. And at these young restoration sites, the new plantings can be easily overgrazed. So what's the deal with all these massive herds of animals grazing all over Chad? To understand that, we need to learn about the fascinating life of nomadic herders. There are between 20 and 30 million nomadic herders in the Sahel Zone. During the three-month rainy season, grasses grow up into the Sahara Desert and the herders bring their flocks north. Then as the rains stop and the land dries out, the herders graze their way south again. And this repeats decade after decade, century after century. They move back and forth across international borders as if they don't even exist. When managed properly, this pulse of grazing can actually be a benefit to the landscape because the animals help fertilize the soil. And while the herders are moving all over, the farmers are living in villages, growing food in gardens and raising livestock animals of their own. Despite their different lifestyles, traditional farmers and nomadic herders have largely coexisted peacefully and have found ways to strike a balance that feeds both groups. They even rely on each other, trading grains for milk and meat. But when the land becomes brown and food for the animals disappears, the herders may wander too close to the farmer's fields, where stray animals can quickly gobble up months' worth of farmer's crops, leading to disputes that can quickly escalate and the environmental situation has been getting worse. Because of the impacts of land degradation and drought, fertile land is becoming scarcer. The Sahara Desert has expanded by 10% in the last century. That means more desert and less plants for animals to eat. So the delicate ecological balance that has maintained abundance for both groups is getting thrown off, and it's reaching a breaking point. This is a matter of life. Because here we are dealing with chronic food insecure people. Their land is degraded. So we have conflict between farmers and herders. And this issue goes way back. In fact, struggles between farmers and herders have been documented for thousands of years across the world, like in the story of Cain and Abel in the Hebrew Bible. And it's persisted ever since, with reports of many people around the world continuing to be killed in this type of conflict. 
And in the Sahel, it's affecting the work of the Great Green Wall. But with the common threat of desertification, failure is not an option. So the WFP, the government of Chad, along with their NGO partners and the farmers and herders came together to design a solution that works for everybody. And it turns out this simple design seems to be helping to resolve this struggle. Two years ago, this was a completely degraded landscape, bare, scorched earth. And they put in the half moon water harvesting structures. They planted these thorny pioneer species of acacia here. And now this landscape grows grasses for milk and meat producing animals. And the thorny trees can feed camels and goats during the dry season. But these simple techniques are not just the half moons that we keep talking about. On these sites, they dug strategically positioned ditches that separate the restored land from the degraded land. The design is specifically aimed at creating peace between the nomadic herders and the settled farmers. On one side of the ditch, the nomadic herders graze their animals. And on the other side of the ditch, the farmers are growing a forest. Grazing animals are slowed down by this ditch, and it serves as a clearly visible barrier that helps the herders keep their animals out. The World Food Program and the local government have negotiated an agreement between these groups, so they honor this boundary. Here in Klimti, there is very nice deals where pastoralists and farmers come, sit down, make a design, they make these trenches to make a clear demarcation of forest areas. They cherish it like a baby. Yeah, 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 they cherish it like a baby, yeah. And so these ditches right now, this is the line between where the pastoralists can keep their animals on this side and where the farmers are doing the land restoration on this side. And in exchange for pastoralists keeping the agreement, they dug a pastoral pond to give the pastoralists a water supply on the outside of this barrier. So essentially on this site and in this whole area, they've mapped out corridors for where the herders will move their animals through. And then they've created water sources within those corridors so the herders don't need to cross through the farmer's land. It's a big design with restoration sites and herder corridors delineated throughout a large area. These community agreements between the farmers and herders are only possible because the land restoration has created so much abundance. And now we have the proof. We can clearly see the change in vegetation on one side of the ditch versus the other. This is the power of these half moon water harvesting structures planted with pioneer tree species. Look at the grasses here. You can hear the sounds of insects, the sounds of birds. No one can believe from outside that communities can turn degraded land into a forest land within two years using simple techniques. The villagers were eager to share about how the restoration project has completely changed their lives. The plants grown in the restoration site are used as fodder to feed the animals owned by the farmers that live in this village here. And they even have enough that they're actually selling surplus fodder to the nomadic herders. It's providing wood for cooking and for the needs of the villagers. Their food security has increased because of all this fodder. Their personal security has increased because of the peace now with the nomadic herders. So this is a spectacularly dramatic change in just two years and 300 acres of water harvesting and reforestation. The herders benefit a lot from the work the farmers are doing within the restoration areas. Not only are the farmers cutting and selling fodder directly to the herders to feed their animals, there are also downwind and downstream effects that benefit nearby grazing areas. With this shelter belt, with the trees getting the ground covered, now the winds no longer bring sand. The air has cleared up. It's also a seed bank where seeds from the trees, shrubs, and grasses blow in and sprout in adjacent areas. And the water infiltrated in the restoration areas seeps downstream to moisten soil, create wetlands, and build underground water tables. The effects of a mosaic of restoration sites within a region will have a positive effect on all the land around. It helps the farmers, it helps the herders, and it helps the wildlife. 
Once these systems are in place and peaceful relations and prosperity are growing, it opens the doors for even more advanced levels of food production. We headed down the road to a more mature project where the water is now so abundant that they've built fish ponds for an even more diversified food system. You've got to remember, this was a dehydrated and degraded landscape, and now there are ponds full of water where they're raising fish. This is a direct result of the work that's been done. You can see when you look in these shallow wells, the water table is close to the surface. So even in the summertime, even in the dry period, this area is going to be better off because all of these structures during this wet period are infiltrating water and building that shallow subsurface water table. That water can be pumped out and utilized during the dry season. This is the peak of the rainy season right now. So in just a few months, this land is gonna look way drier. It's when you get in points of scarcity, water scarcity, food scarcity, the tensions can arise between village farmers and nomadic herders. When you have abundant resources and people are doing well, then you are stabilizing the society, stabilizing the culture. The health of the landscape determines whether or not people and animals can eat and drink, which are the basic conditions for life and community. Scarcity inherently leads to tension. But this also means that we have the power to create the conditions for harmony by restoring land to its highest state of agricultural and ecological productivity. There's still a long way to go, and there are many other root causes that need to be addressed to fully resolve the challenges in the Sahel region. But one thing remains clear to me. We can take degraded, depleted, damaged land and turn it back into a thriving ecosystem. The recipe works. We're seeing it here in Africa again and again and again. This is completely possible. Anywhere in the world, we can bring back biological wealth. There's these beneficial cycles that just work with each other to increase food security, increase nutrition for the people, increase the water table, increase the habitat, increase the tree cover, increase the prosperity, and increase the peace. Are you ready to transform deserts, create lush backyards, and feed communities? In my almost 30 years as a permaculture designer traveling the world, I've put everything I learned into Oregon State University's online permaculture design course, or PDC. The PDC and PDC Pro are the ultimate ways to begin mastering permaculture. Me and my team guide you through over 20 assignments with more than 100 hours of top quality video lectures and resources, all focused on developing your own property or project throughout the course. You'll get personalized feedback from a dedicated instructor in a small group setting. People are always asking me, how can I be part of the solution? This is your starting point. Check the link below for upcoming courses and join us in creating a better world for everyone. See you in class.